Hi, and hello from Boston, Massachusetts. Oliver Freudenreich, or Dr. F here for the Psychopharmacology Institute. In this quick take today, we are going to look at an important question that you may have if you're asked to treat somebody with first episode psychosis or first episode schizophrenia. Which antipsychotic should I start? To help you answer this question, we're going to look at a 2024 perspective paper by Matei Marcotta and colleagues from the prestigious Mayo Clinic in Rochester, New York, published in the journal Schizophrenia. In the introduction to their paper, and kind of to justify the need for this paper, the authors correctly point out that the guideline from this American Psychiatric Association, this schizophrenia guideline that is, is not directive enough for many clinicians who need more concrete guidance, particularly people who are still learning the craft. They also note that existing guidelines differ in their conclusions and need an update. So they wrote this paper to provide updated guidance for the initial treatment selection with the Gardston antipsychotic for early stage schizophrenia. Basically, they came up with an algorithm about antipsychotic choice for first episode psychosis. To produce this algorithm, they focused on medications that had long-term efficacy data, data on all-cause treatment discontinuation, and data on mortality. The algorithm is summarized in the form of a figure in this paper that I will now try and describe. So imagine a typical flow diagram starting from the top. Okay, you got that? After you made the working diagnosis of a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, now we are at the top of this algorithm, okay? The first and most critical decision point where the paths now diverge is if there is violence or not, which leads you into these two different pathways. Let me say this differently. You basically stratify patients into one of two groups. Patients without violence on the left or patients with concurrent violence on the right. Now, violence can be subtle, like being hostile, which is what is often measured in uh, clinical schizophrenia trials with typical rating scales. In patients without violence, the first path on the left, most guidelines prioritize using antipsychotics that have a low risk of side effects, particularly weight gain and the metabolic syndrome. Now, the authors disagree here and put, in alphabetical order, aripiprazole, olanzapine, perfenazine, and risperidone as equally good choices for the first antipsychotic trial. So I will come back to the point about the metabolically high-risk antipsychotic olanzapine. Let's stick with going down the algorithm right now. Are you still with me? Imagine the flow diagram, okay? If there are side effects for the first selected antipsychotic, you should switch to an antipsychotic with different side effects. Most patients with first episode psychosis, by the way, should have a good response to your first line treatment. However, if a patient does not respond to your first choice, you switch to a second choice and then you switch to clozapine. That's the first arm or pathway. In patients with comorbid violence in the setting of psychosis, the second path now on the right, if you will, the algorithm looks fairly simple. It looks different, but again, it's quite simple. The first antipsychotic ought to be olanzapine, followed by clozapine if there is not a good response to olanzapine and assuming clozapine is feasible. So there are basically two key aspects to the algorithm. One is the initial important stratification based on the presence or absence of violence. And the other is the inclusion of the metabolically high-risk antipsychotic olanzapine as a good initial treatment in addition to risperidone, aripiprazole, and perfenazine. I tend to agree with including olanzapine as a good first-line choice. It never made sense to me to exclude a highly effective antipsychotic like olanzapine based merely on possible side effects that can be managed with, for example, metformin. The authors review a large body of fairly recent literature that indicates that long-term management with olanzapine does not lead to worse outcomes, including mortality, when compared to risperidone or aripiprazole. I think the explanation may be, among other things, that using a psychiatrically effective treatment like olanzapine that patients take reliably because of good benefits, that may allow patients to take care of their medical problems better. According to the old adage, 
there is no health without mental health. No health meaning no medical health without mental health, which of course would drive mortality. Again, I would tend to agree to not exclude olanzapine reflectively, reflexively, that is. If there is a problem, you could always change course. Olanzapine is also anorectic, to use that Greek word that I really like, or calming, which can help with sleep, and many patients like that. And that may be one factor in the persistence with olanzapine shown in many clinical trials. They also resurrected profenazine, one of the older first-generation antipsychotics for this algorithm as a first-line choice, based on an overall good mix of efficacy and tolerability, but really mostly based on the KD trial, if you remember this NIMH trial from many, many years ago. I used to use profenazine quite a bit, but the concern about tardive dyskinesia tempers my enthusiasm, although the authors claim it has the lowest risk of TD among first-generation antipsychotics. I'm not sure if that's actually true or has been proven. The authors acknowledge that emisulpride could be an oversight since it was not included in the algorithm as a first-line choice, but they practice in the United States, as I said, in Rochester, New York, where emisulpride is not available. People from outside the U.S. may certainly want to weigh in here and include it. I particularly like the initial stratification and choice of olanzapine immediately followed by clozapine as a second step for patients who are hostile or violent. There are several randomized trials now that clearly show better efficacy for clozapine and olanzapine compared to haloperidol, particularly in patients with conduct disorder or sociopathy in addition to their psychosis. It is unfortunate that haloperidol, for example, continues to be used widely in forensic settings, despite better choices being available. The authors briefly discussed the choice of long-acting injectables, which I think should definitely be considered and discussed as a good first-line option, with good evidence for reducing relapse and possibly mortality in first-episode patients. Aripiprazole and risperidone have the advantage that they can be easily switched to the long-acting injectable formulation once tolerability is established with the pill. Olanzapine is more problematic there, since many treatment systems in the United States are not set up for the monitoring requirements for long-acting injectable olanzapine for a few hours after giving the injection. Not sure what the rules are for other countries. But profenazine is also not available as a long-acting injectable in all countries, including the United States. Here's my clinical bottom line for today. For first episode patients, the first decision about which antipsychotic to use needs to be made based on the presence or absence of violence. If there is violence, try olanzapine first and then go immediately to clozapine. If there is no violence, discuss one of four choices with your patient. Olanzapine, risperidone, perfenazine, or eripiprazole. These four stand out with regards to having the best long-term efficacy and safety data, including mortality, according to the authors. So they are good starting points for discussion with your patient. And just as an aside, I usually limit my discussion to aripiprazole or olanzapine with first episode patients if I want to follow the logic of this algorithm we just discussed. Thank you for listening to this quick take today. Mm -hmm.